Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Dietrich Ayala, who's a two-decade veteran of the open source movement and a longtime friend of the Filecoin IPFS ecosystem. Dietrich, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for having me on. So Dietrich, tell us a bit about your background in the open source world and to get started, and then tell us about how you ended up in the Protocol Labs Filecoin world. Yeah, sure. Uh, open source old AF. Uh, I think my first <laughs> open source project was ni- maybe 2000 or 1999. I put it on SourceForge. It was written in PHP 3. And it was an implementation of uh, SOAP, the simple object access, simple object access protocol, XML schema, uh, WSDL, and some other stuff like that all bundled into one toolkit that could run on those $5 a month PHP hosting platforms because you couldn't customize the PHP binary on those. So you needed libraries that you could include. So it ended up being really popular, companies big and small, a couple of massive publishing companies were using it. And I kind of started going down the open source route at that point, writing bad code and giving it away for free. Key, <laughs> key career move. Um, so I, I, I did that for a bunch of, like uh, got a few jobs, got a you know, book chapter published, stuff like that. And then um, started hacking on Firefox when it came out. And I wrote a extension for Firefox that imported your, uh, there was a service called Delicious at the time that was really popular. It was when tagging was new and uh, it integrated Delicious and the Firefox bookmark store. So anything you save to the service would magically appear, sync into your local bookmarks. And so one, it was good to have a copy of your stuff locally uh, on your computer because who knows how long these companies were going to be around at the time, right? And um, two, it's just be able to have your you know, all of the stuff that you found online all tagged but integrated into your, into your bookmarks. And the, the code for Firefox was terrible for this. So, so bad that the Mozilla folks reached out and said, so we, we see that you are happy hacking on this stuff that we know is bad. Do you want to make it better? And so I was working at Yahoo at the time and I was doing like 80 hours of meetings a week. And I was like, yes, I would love to not do all these meetings and instead hack on open source code for like, and so I spent um, 13 years hacking on Firefox and all these related projects, DevRel, project management, engineering management, um, the entire world of a very large open source project, a, a VLOSP now, new acronym. And um, one of the final things that I did there before leaving was a little project called LibDWeb. And this is the idea that what would we need to do to be able to have two browsers talk directly to each other? So no publisher intermediary, decentralized in a very hyper local way, but also maybe could connect to much larger cooperative networks with P2P, things like IPFS. And this little project, immediately the IPFS folks uh, implemented IPFS on top of these libraries that we made for for browser extensions. And Mozilla wasn't super interested and I wanted to explore that world more. So I left and joined Protocol Maps. This was early 2019. So jumped from, I write desktop browser software and do a lot of evangelism for the open web uh, strategy for open web adoption, things like that. But almost all like things just, purely desktop software, it was like the, it's the Firefox implementation of web, any web browser's implementation world, right? Desktop or and then mobile. And then switching over to this world of much larger P2P networks and much deeper into that world with IPFS, the underlying peer-to-peer toolkit, libp2p that it uses and builds on top of, and Firefox. So this vision of uh, in near infinite storage that is accessible, standardized, and available to everyone. And these things really kind of tied in neatly with how I felt about user agency and the ability to control your own data and have a copy of your own things and be able to sleep at night knowing that those like, you know, 200,000 photos you have across Flickr and Google Photos and, you know, your your Dropbox and all this stuff, that all of that, you know, is, can be somewhere, right? Like we have to solve that problem eventually. We can't just always be committing to one company Coming from the web standards background, I was super, super interested in like what these these a open standard, open an open network for storage. Just seemed like if you walk backwards from the vision I want to see of the world, you eventually get to some open standards way of doing these types of things. And that was I've been in that in that universe with awesome people like you for the last six, seven years at this point. Awesome, awesome. Um, 
maybe talk a bit about like what what was your role in Protocol Labs? Like, what how are you focusing most of your time and energy? Uh, I know you were kind of involved in you kind of had your hand in a bunch of different projects, but how are you spending your time there? And then uh, kind of how are you involved in the ecosystem currently? <laughs> There's just so much stuff to do in a place like Protocol Labs, right? Where you're, you're like, okay, we don't have one product. We have three to 10 products and they're, some of them are in whole networks and ecosystems and open source universes, all of their own, right? So all, all kinds of stuff. But my focus was definitely IPFS. So I was like uh, really driving core parts of the IPFS project for a bunch of years. Um, anchored, obviously, based on my history and interests, deeply in the browser integrations of IPFS. Uh, if you want any new protocol to be adopted at large and you want it to have the benefits that it purports to have, it's especially for something like IPFS, has to be implemented all the way out at the edge. For a user to have control of their experience online and to have control of their data and to reap a lot of the rewards of what IPFS can offer, you need to be able to have it as locally as possible. That means ultimately being part of the web. Being part of the web is a really big hill to climb. The web is HTTP centric, like oh, it's, I'll be the only protocol that browsers implement. So trying to cross that chasm, to bridge that gap, to overly draw out overused metaphors, somehow make something that is IPFS or IPFS like has the characteristics of IPFS, it allows people to have a full and complete working copy of the applications and data they use, allow them to share with other people without needing an intermediary centralized server and to be able to have that trust that you have verified that the, that data is what you think it is. And IPFS brings you all of those types of things. But the web today doesn't have any of those characteristics really. Right? The design of HTTP is on top of a security model called the same origin model. And that basically means that every, everything that you do on the web goes through one publisher. That's that, that domain name. Uh, we're all familiar with domain name system, at least. You at very least know .com, right? Even if you're a non-technical user, everybody can recognize what a domain name is. They've seen them a million times. But what that means is it's a contract, basically, standardized contracts between you and that publisher. And part of that contract is that you trust that what the publisher sends you is correct. And it is what you asked for and it is what you wanted. Uh, we've all kind of felt the limitations of that. And honestly, to be able to send a direct message to you, Aaron, I shouldn't have to have a separate four paid third party corporation trying to find a way to profit off that personal interaction we're having. Uh, there's no open standards way to do that right now, still to this day, that is built into the web or the operating systems or the applications that we use every day. Um, so that, that aspect of, of IPFS was so, so, so important and pushing that technology out, out to the farthest edge, out to the glass of what regular people use and hold in their hands every day, stare at and screens every day is, is, is really the goal. Um, after five years, I can't say that we totally got there. It's a, more like a 20 year journey or a 30 year, I don't know, uh, remains to be seen, but we made some significant strides. I think we got implementations in a few different browsers um, we got various bits and bobs of the web. The web is really complicated. I'm, I'm working on another side project I'm going to talk about later. Um, There's mapping basically the entirety of the web platform, and it's over 14,000 independent pieces. And even that is just the HTTP paradigmatic stuff, right? Uh, oh, wow. Nothing weird like P2P. So it's, it's, it's really big. It's really hard. And every one of those little nooks and crannies of the web have like decade or multi-decade long histories experts, sometimes whole industries behind them, sometimes whole businesses and, and, and groups of businesses that are behind different aspects of the web that we use every day. Uh, and so making change there must be done carefully, deliberately, can't go crazy, can't put regular people's everyday lives and their data at risk. So you have to be very, very careful and intentional. It's very long, slow, difficult work. I'm still doing, yeah. even though I love Protocol Labs, I'm doing some of that work still under this umbrella of webtransitions.org, a place where uh, we had to do all this work while it was Protocol Labs that in order to make IPFS in browsers even possible, you had to do all this other stuff. You had to fix how the local host handling in Safari worked in a mobile 
for example, or you need to fix an incompatibility between you know, one little API in Firefox and then another little API in Chrome that was just different enough that it made things problematic and difficult to implement. None of that is specific to IPFS and or libp2p or Filecoin, but it makes the it, it lowers the barriers for anybody trying to do new and different and interesting things on the web when that stuff, air quotes, just works. So that work I still want to continue, and I'm still working on IPFS and libp2p stuff as well. But the, but that work just didn't have a home, and so that work I've I've kind of kept going through different ways, and some of it's still funded by PL and IPFS because it's important to have that that work done. Um, but changing the web in a big way requires a whole lot of little changes here and there. Well, I mean, you you and the IPFS team, I mean, you were successful in getting to the point where like IPFS is kind of just this fundamental component of, of at least the web three world, right? Where mm -hmm. it, it's almost to the point where like everyone just assumes that IPFS is being used. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, people, you know, sometimes like people like, you know, submit a project for a hackathon and they're like, Oh, like I use, I, I use IPFS. I should be able to get the bounty. Right. It's like, well, no, like that's just <laughs> assumed. Like that's, that's like saying I used Microsoft office or something yeah. like that. It's like that. saying you used HTTP. For a web yeah, project. right. Exactly, right. It's, right. exactly. Exactly. And it's like, so I think, I mean, I think we, I feel like you, you guys have done a really good job of getting this to the point where like, this is sort of standard operating procedure for the web three world, but the you're tackling yeah. kind of the web two legacy web world is an entirely different animal, which I think to your point, like, you know, integrating with like brave and these other browsers just becomes, you, you have to get this stuff as close to the retail user as possible for, yeah. for, and, for any and, of this stuff. Like, you know, brave turned off, uh, IPFS functionality recently It's really complicated to be able to get to merge these worlds in a way that makes sense. And the the way that the, the kind of operating model of browser architecture of how they're implemented and built today doesn't jive well with something that requires persistent connections, that requires uh, a listening socket, for example. There's no browser in the world basically that operates that way. And for good reasons, generally, uh, it's just a different threat model and the web as we know it isn't, isn't built that way. Uh, one of the challenges I think in, in in, uh, in IPFS is actually, you know, you you have some success in the Web3 world. Uh, whole chains now are like, all right, we want our, our chain states to be available on, on IPFS. So not only do you have addressing happening for individual transactions, people want to reference off-chain data using IPFS, but you have the chains themselves want using IPFS to be able to uh, store, share, and make available archival chain state data for long periods of time. And so you do have that level of adoption, but also a lot of that was happening through centralized gateways. People weren't always running their own nodes or they were paying very small group of companies to run their IPFS nodes. And it's harder then to reap the benefits of the protocol if there's fewer sources of that data. The protocol, IPFS protocol becomes faster, more resilient, more reliable and cheaper the more people that are actually hosting data. So integrating, integrating that protocol in a way that allow, like pushes the data itself out to the edge is a really key part of the protocol achieving its its promise. I think you know with a with a large enough network, you can really start to reap some of those benefits. And projects like uh, what the Saturn project was doing and the Station project, and Saturn is now part of merged with Web three storage into the Storacha project. And so these these efforts to have much larger availability networks for this data, I think is going to get us a lot closer than. Uh, for example, historically using one IPFS uh, HTTP gateway, having many, many gateways. A, a world where the entire IPFS network, every one of those nodes is available on HTTP is actually maybe the, the best of both worlds. And it really does seem like that convergence is, is going to happen over time. There's definitely the direction that the IPFS protocol is going. All the work that the team is doing, doing now is around HTTP features, which is great. So let's talk about this IPFS in space project that I know you've been pretty involved with. So this Eric, one, just for background. You're supposed to say IPFS in space. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll let you announce it properly, but uh, I'm just I'm just reading from the script. But I'll let you I'll let you, uh, you know, uh, pronounce it and enunciate it uh, properly. But. Uh, so just for by, by way of background, this is a project uh, between Filecoin Foundation, Protocol Labs, and and Lockheed Martin uh, to to basically deploy IPFS technology in the context of of space communications uh, via satellites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this has been in the works for a couple of years now. It's not necessarily new. We've we've put out a few announcements about it. 
Um, but you've been one of the kind of the, the core contributors on this project, from what I understand. So we'd love to kind of get your get the brain dump from you on on what is happening here. And I understand, I think it was last October of 2023, there was a, a successful mission uh, to actually deploy IPFS in space. And um, so, yeah, we'd love the brain dump from you on like, what's the state of this project? Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, Marta from the head of the Falcon Foundation and met some of the folks at Lockheed at a conference a few years back. And uh, they had ideas around around innovation and in the, in the, uh, you know, what they're calling the space economy that, that it's growing as we've seen so much more commercial activity happening in space and how even a lot of like non-commercial activities running over commercial services um, more and more. These organizations are really looking 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Like the capital costs for doing any type of thing in space is so high that there's a small number of people of organizations that are even capable of doing it. Um, and a lot of the, what you see really ties in, you know, commercial space ends up being either government related and involving a few different very large companies. So there's an interesting opportunity with Lockheed's desire to push on some areas of innovation and space uh, software architecture. They wanted an application layer on their platform that will allow their customers to ship space space economy applications in a way that was more flexible, standards oriented. Uh, all of the U.S. government orientation around funding in space ha has shifted towards standardizable, componentizable, reusable approaches, whether it's at the hardware level or the software level. And so. Our, our ability to have application layer code that runs on top of IPFS that doesn't have to care about the underlying network transports becomes a really interesting prospect for these types of environments. Uh, when you combine it with IPFS's resilience to disconnection. So if I request a file from you in IPFS, I have a full and complete working copy of that file locally once that, that file exchange is complete. That matters a lot when maybe you only have six minutes of connectivity two times a day, as depending on the orbit that your satellite is in. So the unique requirements of software architectures that need to be viable in the conditions of operating in space, either Earth orbit or lunar orbit or exchange of data in between Earth and the moon, um, or even farther out, IPFS is uniquely suited to this. Uh, when you have built in basically like data correction, like a, the cryptographic verifiability aspect of how IPFS addresses are generated and then how that data is then requested and shared on the network gives you a high level of trust when you're also subject to things like solar radiation and all of the other things that can make it difficult to operate software in, in space conditions. Um, so we, we, over a couple of years, had this conversation that was kind of ongoing developing what a architecture for uh, transport agnostic, cryptographically verifiable applications in space might look like. And ultimately this ended up in a demonstration mission. Uh, and that was the launch uh, or the, the demonstration, the launch was earlier in 2023 in the satellite that we deployed on, uh, but that was the mission where we basically sent up this application to a satellite that was in space. And we exchanged data between an IPFS application running on the satellite and IPFS application running in a ground station. So there's we had a, a series of tests that we ran. We uploaded the IPFS white paper and the file, an image of the Filecoin Corgi mascot and, and things like that. Um, and then ran a bunch of ran a bunch of tests. Like did did it work? Can we exchange IPFS addressed data um, between a satellite that's actually in space and and a ground station? And it, it did function as expected. And, I think uh, one of the things that I got to learn along the way is, uh, of course, it's going to, for the most part, because you tested it so deeply along the way. Everything from testing in laboratory conditions, testing in virtual conditions, testing in equivalent hardware on the ground, even before ever moving ahead towards a actual space-based mission. So hugely educational for me. I had almost no experience at all in the space industry, but it was one of the folks who just, you know, kind of like 
it raised my hand or was left standing when everybody else stepped back in, in taking this project and making sure that it didn't hit the floor. I really thought it was important in telling the story of these architectures. Like not only like this architecture that IPFS Alliance stores applications, it, it, it is super useful at the hyper, hyper local when you and I are in the same physical space in the same room and we wanna share an image. It should, that image shouldn't have to go from our phone out to telco networks, out to third party platforms and back again. It should just be able to go quickly and easily between our two devices, respecting that privacy boundary. Like, uh, they should never have to leave the house. Technically it doesn't. Things like AirDrop have kind of made that more common to do that kind of thing, but still most people still end up sharing on a third party network. With IPFS you can have that hyper-local utility as well as the extreme remote utility of being able to communicate in space. Uh, so we're, we're talking about other projects uh, that actually this work was just presented at the I, AIAA Ascend conference, um, yeah. which is, uh, they call, the space folks told me it's the Super Bowl of space, both academic and commercial. So um, that paper was submitted there and presented by one of the Lockheed engineers that we worked with. Uh, and they said that, you know, hall hallway conversations after that were great. A bunch of people wanted to know um, about, about the system. So it, it's one of those things, again, I, apparently I only work on really long time horizon things. <laughs> Browsers, it takes 10 years to get something done in browser land and in space, it's gonna probably take longer. But yeah, it is, it's really interesting and stuff. And I got to learn a bunch of a bunch of things about that industry uh, along the way. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. It's a super interesting project. And uh, there's a lot of color there that I hadn't heard before. So thank you for that. Um, I guess my question to you, and I appreciate that maybe you're not a space economy expert, or maybe you now are now after this project, but uh, it's not like your background, it's a space economy <laughs> guy. But uh, but how do you, I mean, what do you see as like the potential for this technology to be like deployed more, like, like if, if, if we are at the point where like this can be deployed at scale in space, in, in the in this interplanetary context, right, uh, as is in the name of IPFS, like, what does this actually enable, uh, you know, in, in kind of layman's terms? Like, what does this enable that we can that we could do we could do with this technology that we couldn't do with with just sort of the legacy systems? Uh, I think I think when you look at some of the projects that are happening right now, like like this this collab between I think it was like uh, Nokia and um, and McDonald or Lockheed, one of those projects around deploying five G networks on the moon. These these groups, like not only is NASA, European Space Agency, all the U.S. government, and all of these commercial organizations, they're all looking really far out. In and these are plans around 2029. You're looking through these. These are public documents, right? Like there's nothing, nothing secret about a lot of this stuff. These are they're talking about 2028, 2029, 2032. Like they're looking really far out. And and so when you think about how would the how would the velocity, the pace of innovation, the ability to deploy products that we have terrestrially today, how would we replicate that in these extreme conditions where communication takes much, much, much longer, where uh, hardware is much, much more expensive, where data storage, we have far less of it. Uh, how would you increase the velocity of your ability to make things happen in that type of environment? That's where IPFS really is an edge. It is not proprietary. You don't have to pay anybody to use it. It's an open standard. Uh, it mitigates the cost at many different levels, both monetarily, but also like time cost and resource cost in these types of environments where if you ask for something once as, an, as, as a lunar satellite is actually going around like a cis, cis lunar orbit uh, communication as well, it, when, you're, when you need to exchange data in those conditions, your application shouldn't have to know about all of that other stuff below it. Uh, mm -hmm. Web applications today, and, and let's be let's be honest, native applications on our phones are basically all using HTTP under the covers to communicate for the most part. HTTP itself is changing to be able to be more performant in these conditions, but like it, it won't really it won't really work the same. You won't be able to you won't be able to have the request response patterns necessarily the same in these types of conditions, especially with the long long wait times as we do today. They, uh, and you mentioned the Not Your Parents Web Project, which we could talk about a little bit. But one of the things that we learned in studying the web itself is that the web today, the HTTP web is very fragile and it doesn't live very long. It, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's gone. Being dependent on the domain name system, 
being dependent on independent publishers, being in a specific place at a specific time. It's very fragile architecture. Uh, the, uh, nearly nearly two thirds of the web dies every few years. Like it's a high churn rate. And think, I mean, think about it. If you, if you change a file name from selfie.jpg to selfie.jpeg, and it's that same file, that link dies. And if you don't change it back, it dies forever. So HTTP addressing as the core for thinking about how you want uh, multi-planetary or orbital, orbital communication to happen is, is almost a non-starter from, from thinking about what the, the robustness of resilience condition or requirements that you'll have for an, software and application architecture like that. And that's why I think that IPFS, that combination, it is an unbeatable combination in this regard of cryptographic verifiability. Like you, you will only get what you asked for. And if it doesn't exist, you won't get it. Uh, but you will not get something different. And that type of that type of verifiability provides the high trust level that you need. And when you combine that with the fact that it's transport agnostic at that point, you don't care who you get it from because you can verify that it's correct. That means you have uh, one of the scenarios that we talked about with uh, Lockheed in the demo, which is frenemy communication. You need a satellite that you have the address that you trust because you got it from, say, a laser beacon that can can transmit very small, very small amounts of information. You can get an address, and then you can get a a patch or a firmware update for a spacecraft from another spacecraft that may or may not be your friend, but you can cryptographically verify that the data that you received is what you asked for. And because of that, it doesn't matter who you get it from. And the flexibility and robustness of application architectures built on top of that type of foundation is something that's gonna be required for any, for any of this stuff to work, work quickly, efficiently, and reliably. That's super interesting. Um, and it takes me back to another point you mentioned earlier, uh, I want to kind of double down on which was that you mentioned that the U.S. government has been really promoting uh, or endorsing, you know, kind of this modular, interoperable, open source approach with regards to so um, many acronyms. Selecting, yeah, <laughs> selecting selecting vendors to, for building out kind of you know the like the the you know space tech I guess or space economy type of uh, uh, these types of contracts, these types of vendors. Maybe talk a bit more about like why they are. Like, why are they moving in this direction um, versus opposed to what they were doing before, whereas maybe everything's a bit more close, like closed silo? Um, is this a new shift or is this something that's been going on for a while? Or and then maybe how does this whole like IPFS play maybe fit into that? It, I, I don't really know the background. Right? Like a lot of this, uh, some of these efforts came out of uh, con congressional action on space costs. Uh, from, from what I was reading. Some of it is coming out of the military. Some of it is coming from um, really just looking at how, how much these things actually cost and not giving contractors unlimited budgets. Um, we've seen everything from aerospace uh, to, all, to infrastructure. Um, you don't get the blade check that you used to. Uh, so I think that I, I wish I could find this, this document because I would love to read you this list of acronyms that I gathered at, at one point. <laughs> Um, it's in, it's 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 uh, fascinating and frightening uh, because I was trying to answer this question like where where's this drive coming from and it actually was it was like maybe three four years ago there actually was uh, legislation passed that made these requirements but where specifically the, that legislation originated from uh, I'm I'm not I'm not sure uh, the the upside is that is that development in these areas has historically been incredibly expensive and proprietary, so not reusable. Like that created an incentive for very large government contractors to continually build new stuff and not make stuff that was reusable and have, not have a culture of reusability, uh, not have a culture of, of open standards or interoperability. But I think when you combine the fact that they, the culture of how that's funded has changed over, over the years, and then you look forward another 15 years and you can see, I think, it, the concern that I would see anyway is that the velocity, like our ability to innovate quickly would be really hampered by a culture of closed, proprietary only, non-interoperable uh, applications and platforms and where all of those parties are fighting with each other for, for territory and ownership, as opposed to being able to interoperate and collaborate with each other. When you look at like, I, I, I would not be surprised if they look at the success, the success of the internet over the last 30 years as an example of where open standards 
and open interoperable protocols allowed incredible acceleration of innovation and availability of technology. And um, just to wrap up here, I'd love to talk a bit about this mapping project that you've been working on that you've alluded to a couple of times. Um, and I mean, you've kind of given us the overview of it, I think. But like, let's dive into to what exactly are you trying? I mean, it's called Not Your Parents Web, right? So what, what, oh. what are you trying to do with this? What are you um, what, what, what are your what are your findings here? So those are two different projects, but oh. I think that's fine. I'll do rapid fire through three okay. different projects. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. So the, the first one is this project uh, called Web Features, and it's actually part of the W3C uh, developer experience group. And so this is all of the browser vendors uh, looking at all of the 14,000 plus individual unique components that make up the web, everything from every last CSS property to every last parameter to every last function in JavaScript and, and JavaScript APIs and web, that are implemented in web browsers, and then every single HTML tag and every attribute and every possible value of those attributes. Right now, we think about standards as something that maybe the W3C, wizards of the W3C develop and dictate, and then browsers go and implement them. But that's not really how it happens. It actually happens in reverse. The way that web standards emerge now, and really for, for a very, very long time, is that browsers will see a need in the web developer I guess market, you might call it, in the group of you know 20 million plus developers on the web, and implement something they think might might meet that need. And maybe they won't implement it first. Maybe they'll you know propose it to a broader group, uh, and then another browser will say, yeah, we we see that need too, and we implemented it, but a little bit differently. And eventually those things converge, and maybe the third browser engine will implement it as well, and then you have a web standard. Uh, standards, kind of by loose definition at the W3C, are not there is a document and it's been approved. It is two or more browser engines have implemented it. It starts there. Then maybe there is a document that is eventually ratified as a recommendation of the W3C. So it's the, really the inverse of how people think about it. This project takes, so as you can imagine, a organic process like that has resulted in a scattershot of technologies and implementations that are not all the same across all browsers, that are all browser versions, and then you include mobile, and then it gets a mess. So this project really maps it all out. It creates the canonical data set that can be used by places like Mozilla's MDN, or the Can I Use project, or Code Autocomplete inside VS Code, or whatever. Anywhere that you need to reference what the web is, you can reference this canonical data set. And browser vendors have agreed to register with this project first when they make any changes. I run another side project called Intent to Ship that kind of like shouts out whenever a browser changes something. And it's higher volume than you would think, the, the pace of, of change on the web. It, it, it's really a lot to keep track of. So this canonical single data set that all of these projects and properties and websites and tools can use, it, it's, it's not, it's not uh, shiny, fancy, technically challenging work, but it's really important work that will make the web more stable for the rest of us, for everyone really, and hopefully will pay off for years and years to come. So that's one project that I'm working on uh, with, with Google and Mozilla and Apple and Edge are all, all involved there. Second project that, uh, this is one that's gonna ship, uh, I mean, some of the research has already shipped is this Not Your Parents Web Research Project. This was started all the way back, I think it was a, a tweet exchange in 2019 between uh, me and some of the folks that were working at the Old Dominion University uh, Science Library, Digital Library Department. And I asked the question, like, but what is the average age of a web page? I've heard, you know, there's this research from the Brewster Kale, the founder of the Internet Archive, saying that it's uh, about 90 days. And then sometimes it changes. There's a quote unquote of 44 days. Uh, he did the research back in the late 90s. Well, <laughs> the web was a little different. <laughs> and that's why the, this research project is called Not Your Parents Web, is we wanted to understand deeply the nature of change on the web, like how did it change over the last 30 years? Uh, and what is the, like I guess, lifetime of a web page today? And so the conclusions from that research are going to be published really soon. That group's going to publish. Um, the Five Point Foundation funded a graduate student to work on that for the last couple of years. And we've had the cooperation of both Inner Archive, who've donated a ton of computing and time resources, and then uh, some of the other academics working on this. A bunch of papers and tools have come out of it. And like the long and short of it is that, well, the average web page lasts longer now than it and maybe it did back then, maybe even a couple of years. But every couple of years, nearly two thirds of the web actually dies. 
And maybe the, the Wayback Machine has a copy of it. Maybe it doesn't. A lot of it is never archived at all. Now, does that matter for your corner hair salon or, you know, uh, taqueria? The, if their web page goes away, maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It's not a question we can definitively answer. Should we have the opportunity to understand that it will go away so people who do care about that data can make those archival decisions? Absolutely. And so this project is about telling that story, really understanding the, how, how much of our like human experience that we're publishing on the web is created and then dies quickly so we can make better informed decisions around archiving it. Yeah, um, and that, that, that's super interesting because I, 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 we had uh, recently we had an episode with uh, the folks at Starling Lab, mm -hmm. and uh, in that interview, uh, uh, the guy I was talking to he had this really this phrase that kind of stuck in my head. He's like, "Look, like digitization is not the same as preservation, right? These are like two like yeah. fundamentally different things. Like just because you spin up a website or you have a digital file of some of some sort that is native to the internet does not mean that it's going to be." preserved on the internet, right? <laughs> so I totally yeah, not, not, not at all. And then how you preserve something really matters. Like if you're preserving it for evidence at the International Criminal Court, it has to preserve it, be preserved in a really different way than if you're like, oh, I just want to be able to show my kids a copy of that website that I made way back when. Right. And so <laughs> right. uh, I've done some work with Flickr.org and the Flickr Commons is a group of over a hundred nonprofits that use Flickr as the sole repository of all of the images for their nonprofit. And when you think about these, these dynamics, right? Like the organizations putting their history on a for-profit company that like, yes, Flickr's great, but we use their US-based for-profit company that we cannot guarantee will always be there. And this is why networks of storage, interoperable standards-based networks of storage are, are that, that, that interesting part of the future. And I think the only way that we can even reasonably start wrapping our heads around what it actually means to archive humanity's information. Um, so yeah, super cool. We're gonna have a, uh, the, the anniversary of the Internet Archive is coming up in October. I forget which year, it's over 20 at this point, I think. Um, and so they're gonna publish uh, some more of this research, some of the conclusions, we'll have a blog post. Um, and so I expect to see a, a bunch more shared from the Falcon Foundation uh, and the Internet Archive about this particular research. Awesome. And then was there one more project you want to get through? There, there was. It's okay. Very, it's very specific right. last, to last but not so, least. Okay, last bit. Make it quick. I've been working on a side project uh, with a developer in Hong Kong that I've known for a while and done a bunch of projects with um, that basically takes Filecoin liquid staking tokens. There's a bunch of them. And any of them that are programmatically stakeable and unstakeable wraps them up into one token. So if you want to have some exposure to the Filecoin DeFi ecosystem, instead of having to go through to all these different LSTs and put a little Filecoin in each one and get some of those tokens back and understand you know, the ins and outs of those companies, uh, we interview the founders of those companies and then we curate the set of LSTs that go into one token so you can invest in one token instead of a bunch at the same time. You mitigate your risk that way. Uh, as we've seen, there's some volatility in any DeFi project, but even in Filecoin this, this year. Uh, and so it allows an ease of use and ease of access to Filecoin DeFi, uh, minimizing, mitigating uh, some risk, uh, but also making it easier for folks to participate without having to, uh, I guess, go through each one of these individual services specifically. A lot of these websites are all implemented differently and all the terms are different. So what this does is just rolls a bunch of them up into one token and then evenly splits the investment across all of them. And when you unstake, goes through, gets, you know, if there's liquidity available in, in all these networks, goes through, unstakes as much as it can of what you put in, what you requested to unstake and returns it all as Filecoin again. So Filecoin in, Filecoin out, but on the back end, the token actually contractually invests in a bunch of these different LSTs. So just a little DeFi side project to, I wanted to learn more about how that system works. Uh, I've never launched a token of any kind at all before, so it's been a really uh, interesting learning journey um, and really wanted to increase my knowledge of how these systems work. So I've worked with loads of blockchains at this point, but I've never actually built something like this. So a little bit of learning on the financial instruments standpoint, which is kind of what these what these are, especially once you get into DeFi land and learning about like the 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 end to end of everything from the technology aspects to the business aspect of a project like this. It's been fun. Very cool. Very cool. Um, 
Well, listen, Dietrich, really great having you on the show. Uh, it's just, you have a wealth of experience and knowledge and uh, just like fun stories <laughs> from you know <laughs> two plus decades, like fighting these open source uh, battles and whatnot. So uh, really, really enjoyed this conversation. Really enjoyed having you on here and um, exciting, super excited what you're working on with your side projects, as well as the IPFS and Space Initiative. Uh, I think we're gonna have some more news about that coming out sometime later this year, hopefully. Um, but uh, super cool work that you've been involved in. So really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to join us and just fill us in. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great. Awesome. So thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you on the next episode of DWeb Decoded.